So let me read the scripture for you. And uh, the scripture is from Exodus 33, if you have your Bibles. Exodus 33. I'm going to start 1 through 4 and then 12 through 23. I'm going to skip a a part in the middle, but this is all about Moses and Moses' encounter with the Lord, and um, I'm reading from the NIV version, and uh, beginning in verse 1, then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites and the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and any other rites that are there just for the rest of you. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I'm not going to go with you because you're a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. Now, when the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn. And no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now, take off your ornaments, and I will decide what to do with you. And so the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. Now, we hear then about the tent of meeting. I'm going to skip up to uh, verse 12 here. The tent of meeting is where Moses met the Lord day after day. The other people didn't come in. But coming to verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, Lord, you've been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. Lord, if you're pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. And the Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. And then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see my face and live. And then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. And then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but you must not see my face. Let's pray. Lord God, um, thank you for this faith community, this faith community who calls upon your name, this faith community who is calling upon you to move here in Frederick. Lord, as we're gathered here this morning, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. And Lord, that we wouldn't go anywhere without your presence. Amen. The title today is Stewarding the Presence of God. Turn to your neighbor on the right and say, do you know you are a steward of the presence of God? Turn to your neighbor on the left and say, yeah, but you can't do it on your own. (laughs) Turn to your neighbor on the right and say, you're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Because that's who empowers us for all things, the presence of God who lives in us. And I don't know about you, but every morning, because of this passage, I wake up and say, Lord, 
I don't want to go anywhere if you're not going with me because I can't do anything on my own this day without your presence. I'm not going anywhere if you're not going with me. I want to tell you a story that happened with uh, my friend Deborah, and I'm going to make up a name of the person she met. I'm going to call her Betsy. This is a true story. Deborah uh, lives on the edge here in Frederick. She is in public housing. She loves Jesus, and she has trouble making bills meet each week, but she figures it out. And she works at a place called On Your Own here in Frederick. Anybody familiar with On Your Own? On Your Own really helps peach people here in Frederick who are marginalized to be able to have services, to figure out how to get a job, to figure out how to get health care if they need that. And so Deborah works there. And Deborah's job is to make people feel comfortable when they come in. And so one morning she's working at On Your Own and a woman comes in and she goes up to the woman and greets her and says, hello, how are you? And the woman says, I just want to check out. And Deborah's like, well, there's nothing here that you have to pay for. Everything is free. And I'll call her Betsy, says, no, you don't understand. I want to check out, check out. And Deborah says, will you do me a favor? Will you come with me to the prayer house, which is just two blocks away? This is our prayer house. I didn't even know this happened until she told me this story. And uh, the woman said yes. And Deborah took her to the prayer house and took her upstairs where there's a sofa where you can sit and really listen to people. Deborah listened to this woman's story for about two hours. Listen to her story of hardship and trials. And after a while, the woman started looking around the place where she was sitting. And in the corner of the 24-7 prayer room or the prayer house, we have a little booth. It's a surrender booth. And inside, there's a big red cross. But on the top of it, what you can see before you enter into that little booth is a crown of thorns. And Betsy says, what's that? And Deborah says, well, that's the crown of thorns that Jesus wore when he went to the cross for your sins and my sins. She said, would you like to know more about Jesus? Would you like to have Jesus into your life? And Deborah led Betsy into a prayer of salvation. And <laughs> Betsy accepted Jesus into her life, which is really cool on its own. And then Betsy says, and I think I want a job. And now Betsy has a job and my friend Deborah is mentoring her so that indeed she can know what it's like to follow Jesus and know what that entails. You see, friends, each one of us is called, if we were a follower of Christ, to steward the presence of God. It's the vocation of every person who calls themselves a follower of Jesus. The biblical witness, the Bible, from the Garden of Eden all the way to the book of Revelation shows us that the important thing to God is the presence of God's people with God, right? It started that way in Eden, but sin is the thing that separated us. And then Jesus came, and because of Jesus' righteousness going to the cross for us, we, a sinful people, can stand before a holy God, and we see that happening in the book of Revelation, where God's people are gathered again with him in the presence of God. That's what we see from the beginning to the end because God loved God's created people, every person, so much that he wants them to be in their presence. And so as our guide today, we're going to use Moses because Moses had a bunch of trials as we read here in Exodus 33. What does Moses say? He says, I'm not going anywhere, Lord. I am not taking these people if your presence doesn't come with us. I'm not going anywhere without you. Friends, as we start our days, that's something that we too can say. 
And stewarding the presence of God begins with prayer. Prayer helps us practice the presence of God. Prayer empowers us to see other people as God's created beings because we remember Psalm 24 says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world, the people, and all who live in it. We all belong to God. And as Christians, we believe that God's creative fingerprint is on every human being, but every human being has the potential to say yes to God or no to God. And we read about some of that in Colossians 1. Paul writes, in uh, starting in verse 21, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. And if you continue in hope, held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, have become a servant. You know, and if you condense this verse, it really means the Christ in me greets the Christ in you, right? And so um, today, we want to look at what happens here with Moses. Now, you'll remember that Moses... Uh, you know, I'll give you the quick form of what happened in his life, right? Born during a time of persecution of Hebrew babies, his mama wanted to keep him alive, and so his mama floated him in a basket, found by the princess of Egypt. Princess of Egypt takes him in after he's weaned from his mama, so he gets to understand his Hebrew roots from his mama before he's taken to the palace. But then he grows up in the palace, and poor Moses doesn't even know who he is, right? He's got some Hebrew tendencies, but he's lived in this richness, and he looks out and sees all the people, his people, being uh, tortured by making these bricks, right? They're enslaved in this land, and one day, Moses sees a a soldier from uh, from Egypt uh, whipping, whipping uh, one of his own Hebrew people, and so he goes out and tries to stop it and can't stop it and ends up killing uh, the, the Egyptian. And uh, Moses goes back. He's living in the palace, right? And then the next day, he tries to stop two Israelites, two Hebrews, from fighting. And as he's doing that, stop fighting. One of them says, oh, you're going to kill me like you killed the person yesterday? And Moses doesn't know what to do. So he flees for the high country, right? He flees. And there he's living a fine life. He meets, uh, he, uh, he meets Jethro, Jethro, and he marries his daughter, and they have some kids. And Moses is happy by himself, contending and taking care of the sheep, right? He's a shepherd until God calls him out. Because, you see, God has ordained every step of Moses' way and given, God, uh, given Moses uh, uh, ability to lead people because of his background and We see the burning bush, we hear the story, we hear God call him, and in Exodus 3, we hear the words uh, that God says to Moses, I have seen my people's pain. I've heard their cries. I know their hurt, and I'm coming down, and I'm sending you. And you know that Moses argues, I can't do it, I can't speak. And God's like, yeah, right this very moment, your brother Aaron's coming to see you. He's going to help. And Moses says, I can't do it on my own. And God says, you throw down your staff. And his staff becomes a serpent. Many of you have heard the story. You know the story. And so Moses finally is persuaded by God um, to go and uh, talk to Pharaoh to bring the people out. Pharaoh doesn't believe. And there's plague after plague after plague. And finally, with the final plague, uh, the death of the firstborn in every household, Moses is able to leave. In fact, the people were like, go, go. We don't want you here anymore. And here are all our jewels too, by the way. Take all our jewelry, go. And so they start going and they take all their family and their sheep and their farmers and everything else. Off they go. And suddenly Pharaoh changes his mind and sends the soldiers out of them. You know the story. God parts the waters of the Red Sea. God's people go through that Red Sea. And uh, the Egyptians who were following, the Red Sea comes back and consumes them. And finally, Moses takes them in front of Sinai. 
uh, where they are in the presence of God and God says, you're going to be my people and I'm going to be your God. And this is the covenant that we have between us. You're going to be a covenant people that you aren't going to look like every other person. And so Moses goes up on the mountain and receives the Ten Commandments, and you know the story. He comes down, and suddenly the people have forgotten they're building a golden calf. And Moses is so upset, he throws down the tablets and says, what have you done? And his brother Aaron's like, well, I don't know. We threw this gold in the fire and out jumped this golden calf. (laughs) Yeah, really? And so uh, there is punishment for the people, but finally there is also forgiveness. Moses goes back up on the mountain. He gets the set of commandments again. And now here we are, Exodus 33. And God says, they're a stiff-necked people. I don't care. Now, this is why they're such a stiff-necked people. You just heard the story regurgitated to you, right? They are a stiff-necked people. I am tired of them. And Moses says, Lord, he's contending. This is a prayer that he has. He's arguing with God, right? These are our prayers. If you ever argue with God and come before him, that's okay. Keep arguing. Keep contending before God, right? Keep contending. And so Moses says, wait a minute, these are your people. And if you don't go with us, how's anybody going to know that these are your people? How's anybody going to know? Finally, God says, yeah, okay, I'm going with you. I will go with you. Now, I could stop there, but I love the part about the glory of God. (laughs) Because Moses starts being really bold there, doesn't he? He's got a holy boldness about him. Let me see your glory, God. And I don't know about you, but we've sung songs about that before. Show us your glory, Lord. And I can't imagine what that glory is like. But God passes before him and allows him to see his glory. So I have some questions for us this morning. First question, does the presence of God go with you? As I mentioned, the presence of God, presence with us, practicing the presence of God begins with prayer. But not only prayer for ourselves and our families, like that's easy to do, right? We get that. But how about praying for God's presence in a larger area? Do we pray for our neighbors? What does that look like? I don't know if you're familiar with the Bless Every Home app. It's a great great tool. It's a website or an app, Bless Every Home. And here's the thing. I think I mentioned this last time I was here, but if you go into Bless Every Home, you do have to put your name there and your address, but it will give you the name and address of everybody in your neighborhood. (laughs) which is a little scary, except we realize it's all public information and it has been gathered together for people who believe in the presence of God and we can pray for our neighbors. And I prayer walk my own personal neighborhood as well. And so I have prayer walked and um, I have one particular neighbor, I'm gonna call him Richard, that's not his real name. And I go past his house and I say, hey, Richard, how are you doing? He's like, hi, how are you? He doesn't have a clue who I am, even though I've introduced myself several times. I live two blocks away, but he doesn't have a clue who I am. And we were having some prayer hubs at the rescue mission a little while ago uh, in the month of March. We have uh, the prayer house sponsors prayer hubs in uh, all over Frederick for the month of March every Wednesday. I hope you can join us next year. It's really fun. And people from all different churches come. And we had about 20 people standing in front of the rescue mission praying at 10 a.m. And um, my neighbor Richard comes out and he says, hi. And I'm like, we're praying. Come on. And um, I didn't get to hear Richard's story until that night when we went to the graduation. I'm like, tell me your story. He's like, well, you know, I grew up in a, in a, in a Christian faith, but it wasn't really real to me. And about a year ago, I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And I am on fire for Jesus. And I got to say, well, Richard, you know, I've been praying for you every, day, every time I walk past your house. And he's like, you have? <laughs> yeah, I have. 
that our prayers make a difference. Uh, there's another uh, website or app you can use that's called Streets of Prayer, and it was created by my friend Aki. I commend it to you. Aki's vision is that in 2030, everybody in America has somebody praying for them, everybody who doesn't know Jesus. Like, that's a cool vision, right? I can get on board with that. And so what you do with Aki's is, um, all you do is give your, web, your, your um, email there, <clears throat> And Aki um, sends out uh, every day of the month, every day of the week, sorry, you're going to give uh, the name of somebody you're praying for who doesn't know Jesus. And somebody else is doing that, and every day you get an email to remind you to pray for your person for that day of the week and somebody else's person. So somebody else's person and, and yours. And it's really cool. And I'm going to let you go yourself to hear Aki's story because it's really cool of um, why he started this and has the vision. So here's the deal. We are inviting the presence of God into our space, into our daily rhythms, because God goes where he is wanted. The Holy Spirit lives in every believer. And so we have the authority to ask God to change the atmosphere in the areas of our lives that are hard. That's what Moses was doing right there. He didn't want to go anywhere without God. So he's like, God, I am not going into that scary territory without your presence. So what about you? What about your workplace or an environment, uh, maybe even at home or an environment with relatives or environment where you buy something, whatever it might be? Is the presence of God there? And if not, you can pray for the presence of God to come and transform that area because that's a real thing, which brings me to question number two. What does having the presence of God really mean? <laughs> what does that mean? That might be a question that you're saying, yeah, but what does that mean? Well, we're reminded in Romans 8, and there's a bigger argument that Paul has there, but we're reminded that the Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead lives in every believer. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead abides in every person who has given their life to Jesus. Friends, that is power. And too often we don't tap into the Holy Spirit power that resides in us. Now let me remind you, there is evidence of the Holy Spirit living within you from the fruit of the Spirit. We have fruit of the Spirit and we have gifts. They're two different things. The fruit of the Spirit is talked about in Galatians 5.22. Many of you have heard it before. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's, that's the fruit of the Spirit, right? And we don't always have all of the fruit immediately. Sometimes we're working on some of that fruit, right? So I know for me, I'm still working on the patience fruit, right? I don't know about you all, but sometimes impatience rises up in me and I have to slow down and calm down and say, oh Lord, I really need your patience right here. Um, but that's the fruit of the Spirit. The other thing that the Holy Spirit gives are gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we read about these gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, 8, Ephesians 4, 7, Romans 12, 3. We read about these gifts of the Holy Spirit. And gifts include um, teachers and prophet and helper and evangelist and uh, giver. And there's this whole list that God will empower God's people for. All right? evangelist, and um, so uh, all these others, giving, all these are uh, gift of helps. These are all gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives gifts to every believer. Not every believer has the same, but you have things that are unique to you so that you can use those gifts in the circles of influence in which you walk. And if there's a certain gift that you don't have, you can ask God for it. And sometimes God gives that gifts and sometimes he doesn't. But here is a fact that if you don't use those gifts of the Holy Spirit, 
they will slowly fade away and become non-existent in your life, right? So you get to use those gifts on a regular basis. And so question number three that we might have, what does that really mean? <laughs> what does it really mean practically when we say the Holy Spirit is living in us and gives us gifts? What does that mean when I go out of the walls of this church? It means we can practice the presence of God with those who are around you. You see, we use the gifts of the Spirit in lots of different ways. But most of all, the, the Holy Spirit gives us ways of practicing our faith out in the world. And they're ways of practicing without hitting somebody over the head and say, this is the Bible and you got to believe it. But rather, it's ways of us being gentle out in the world and asking God to give us the right words to talk about. For example, um, each of us knows somebody who's hurting out in the world. And young adults, some kids, whether you're in school or whether you're a teacher, whether you're in the workplace or whether you just have friends. I was just hanging out with my college friends yesterday in Philadelphia because we went to hear um, Priscilla Shire uh, give a message and she does a lot of great uh, women's faith talks. And it was, she's the daughter of Tony Evans, if you know him. And so this, this place was filled with um, Christian believers, and so uh, my, my college friends and I were there. College was a long time ago, I gotta tell you, but uh, the cool thing is we've all grown in grace and in Christ, and we were sharing stories of the presence of God, and sometimes it's us acting as the presence of God, and sometimes it's somebody else acting as the presence of God in our life, and so I wanna tell you a story of my, uh, my girlfriend, Sally. That's her real name. But uh, Sally's husband, unfortunately, died five years ago. And she told us this story that um, on the anniversary of his death uh, last month, she went to the restaurant where they used to love to go. And um, she went by herself. She never goes to a restaurant by herself. But she went by herself, and she just sat there, and she ate her lunch. And then she was just sitting there remembering. She wasn't crying, but I'm sure there was a mournful look on her face. And after a while, the waitress comes up and says, ma'am, excuse me, but um, your bill's paid for. A man uh, in, the, in the table over there paid for your bill. He's already left, but he told you to have a nice day. And my friend Sally said, he must have been listening to the Holy Spirit <laughs> because that just gave me life on a really hard day. You see, sometimes that's what it is. We just sit and, and we pray in the space we're in and we say, we say Lord, what, what do you want me to know about the people who are around me right now? Is there a word you want me to say? What, what does that look like, Lord? And we pause to ask that question. So we have God encounters all the time when we prayer walk um, Frederick, it's really fun. <laughs> it's really fun. <clears throat> and so when we were having these prayer hubs in the month of March, the very first week, um, I think it was March 1, actually, which was a Wednesday. It might have been whatever that Wednesday was, the first Wednesday in March. It was an ugly, rainy day, and we didn't have as many people as we would normally have because it was an ugly, rainy, cold day. And uh, we, we go to five different places, and people can come to whichever one works in their schedule. And we always choose a place that has significance for our African-American friends because um, African-Americans really built Frederick. And uh, there is a great history here. Um, Frederick was part of... Um, the Underground Railroad uh, back, in, uh, back in the day, and so there's a great history here. And so one of the places we were praying in front of is the Arch, which is going to be the African American Heritage Museum, um, and they hope to open sometime in 2025. They just hired a woman, Dr. Gooch, who is a very learned, very bright woman, to be the leader of this place. And there were just three of us praying in front of this building on this really cold, ugly day. And uh, we had just prayed for Dr. Gooch, who had just been hired. 
And as we're praying, a woman is walking down the sidewalk towards us, laden with books. And she looks at us and she says, are you just staring at the pretty building? <laughs> and we're like, no, we're actually praying for this building. And then my friend Roger says, are you Dr. Gooch? And she says, yes, I am. <laughs> and we said, well, we have just been praying for you. Um, uh, and she said, she tells us her story. She is a woman of faith. John 6 is her call for the reason of being there. She invites us inside as they are still preparing this building, and she allows us to lay hands and pray on her. And she is a fervent woman of God. Now, friends, we couldn't have arranged that if we tried, but God ordained that meeting for us. And my point is that when we're trying to steward the presence of God, that God shows up in ways that are beyond our wildest dreams or expectations. And we have encounters that sometimes serve us, but sometimes serve the people that God wants to have an encounter, right? And so let me tell you another story, and I could tell you stories all day, I promise I won't. But I'll tell you another story. Um, we have a team who opens the prayer house every, fri uh, every morning at 8.30 a.m. and a team that closes at 8 p.m. every night. And this particular morning, uh, the woman who was opening the prayer house, <clears throat> she was late, she forgot, I don't know what it was, um, but she wasn't there. And we see on the cameras, ah, oh, it didn't get open today. What's up? And so I texted one person who's nearby, another person, to say, hey, can you open it? I get no answer. And before I texted another person, I felt the Lord telling me, yeah, you got to go open it today. Now, I live in Middletown, so it's a 20-minute drive. It's not terrible, but I had things I had to do that morning. Anybody have things you got to do, and then all of a sudden God interrupts that? Yeah. And so I had this little argument with God because I felt God telling me through the, through the Holy Spirit, yeah, you need to do it today. And I'm like, I don't want to do it today. <laughs> but the argument was short and God won. And so I drove down and opened up and then I just felt like I needed to go up and see another woman that we have met on the street who, um, who uh, was selling her house because she and her husband both have cancer and they've moved to another place. And I'm like all right, I need to go up and see them. And that woman wasn't there, but her sister was. And I can tell you that I had an ordained meeting in a prayer time with that sister whom I had never met. And I knew when I left that God wanted me there to meet this sister. And so, okay, God, forgive me for messing up and missing the opportunity. You see, God has places for God's people to go all the time. And we've got to pay attention we have to pay attention. And sometimes, friends, I miss the moment. I don't know about you. I'll tell you another time. Uh, it was a long time ago that, that still reverberates in my heart because I really miss this moment. Um, when my daughters were little, they used to show goats at the Great Frederick Fair. And uh, I loved going there. It was a Wednesday. I was in seminary at the time. I'm a second career pastor. My daughter was getting ready to show her goats, and I ran over to the food area quickly to grab a bite to eat, and a woman sat down across from me, and uh, she started telling me how she had just moved to Frederick and how she was lonely here and didn't have anybody. Now, friends, I was doing my work in a church in Urbana where she lived, and I missed the moment because my daughter was getting ready to show her goats and I had to run away and I still regret missing that moment of and offering hope into this woman's life who didn't have any hope. Sometimes we miss those moments. But we are to be stewards of the presence of God out in a broken world. And my goal is to not miss those moments as much as I can. A fancy way of saying this is we are co-workers in the redemptive purposes of God. We are co-workers in the redemptive purposes of God because the reality is God desires for every heart of every created being by God to come to know him personally 
to know that he loves them, and for them to know that the God of the universe intentionally created them with purpose and design. God is the one who stirs hearts and prepares hearts, but we are the co-workers of God's work which gives us opportunities to speak about him to those around us. And God invites us into this process. The image of God in which each of us has been created. That image of God or the imago dei is sick and has been compromised because of sin. And our job as followers of Jesus is to help every fellow human being regain that image of God in which we were created. Because God loves us. Which brings us around full circle to the question of how can sinful people be in front of a holy God? You see, Israelites, the Israelites had Moses to go into that tent of meeting. And when Moses came out, his face shone so much that the Israelites couldn't see him. And they asked him to put a veil on his face because he was shining too brightly. The holiness was too bright until it wore off. We cannot be in the presence of a holy God except for Jesus. Jesus who gives us his cloak of righteousness so that we might be called righteous before a holy God and stand in the presence at that final eschatological time or end time. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure that when I'm in that space, I'm going to fall on my knees, weeping, and just say, thank you. What will that look like for each of us? I don't know. But until then, friends, I know that like my friend Deborah, we are the ones to steward the presence of God to our fellow human travelers. And we're continue, uh, we are called to continually call upon God to change the atmosphere. I'm calling on God for another great awakening. A great awakening. They are historic. Go and read about them in the 17th century, in the 18th century. It changed the atmosphere. And I'm calling for God to do it again. And we see bits and pieces of that. I don't know if you read about the outpouring at Asbury, uh, Asbury University last February, February a year ago. But it was real. I got to be there and pray with the students, and it was cool. God was breaking chains of uh, unforgiveness and breaking chains of porn and breaking chains of things that have held, uh, held the students captive. It was awesome. What would that look like? When? God breaks the chains of addiction and all those things here in Frederick and beyond. That's what we're praying into. And we invite you to come and pray in alongside of us so that we, like Moses, may say, Lord, I am not going anywhere without you. And we may join in the redemptive purposes of God. So pour out your hearts, friends. Pour out your hearts to God, the creator of the universe who loves you and who loves all the other people here, that we might be part of that redemptive purpose that's happening right here and right now. Amen. As the praise team comes up, let's, uh, let's pray. Lord God, I um, thank you. And Lord, that we can pour out our hearts before you, Lord. That each and every one of us can think of one person in our life or a coworker or somebody at school, wherever it is, where we need to be the presence of God for that person. Lord, I pray that you lay that person on our hearts now. That when we leave from here, Lord, we can share the hope that we have in you. Thank you, God, that you love each of us so much. Amen.